Hello, I am your everyday average Jonathan. I am an ordinary guy with ordinary tools making extraordinary things. I'm an amateur blacksmith, a novice woodworker, a self-taught craftsman. The things that I make tend to be whimsical in nature, fantastical, echoing times of a forgotten yore, if you will. Things like weapons, armor, furniture, practical items that I use on my ranch here in Colorado every day. Each week I take you on a new project with me. I show you my process, I show you my perspective, I don't edit out my mistakes, I don't edit out my aha moments, I leave them all in. This week I'm very excited. I received a commission to make a bronze belt buckle from my best friend in California. This belt buckle will be made in the traditional style, but more fantastical, perhaps an elven aesthetic to it. I'm looking forward to having you with me this week. Let's get to the shop and get started. As with most of the builds that I do, I start off with graph paper to try to get an idea for the design that's in my head and put it down and make sure that I can accomplish it in three dimensions versus just what I see in my head. I usually come up with a lot of different variables or different options for what I'm trying to do, but in the end, what I've seen in my head all along tends to just dominate. I rarely come up with something that's going to change that. Heading over to my trusty wood pile, uh, grabbing pieces of wood that I'm going to create the form. I'm gonna have to use two different types of saws to cut this form out. The outside will be cut out by the bandsaw, and then the inside's gonna be cut out with a scroll saw, which I don't get an opportunity to use too much, but um, they're, real, they're real fun when you finally get a chance to use them. And honestly, until this particular project, I don't think I've used that scroll saw in probably, man, three to four years. It's been sitting there. It's a, it's a Home Depot special, nothing great about it, but it certainly does accomplish the job. Uh, also, I'm gonna to try to profile the outside portion of this buckle in the wood before I cast it, of course. That'll help me with some grinding and some cutting uh, once the, the, the product is cast. I have a love-hate relationship with a lot of things. The scroll saw, I tend to love, but honestly, I'm not probably very good at it. Uh, there tends to be lots of rework that needed to be done, but this came out fairly quickly. I remember from several years ago that removing the blades from a scroll saw seemed to be much easier. I, whatever reason, I got it wrong this time and ended up breaking one of the blades, but again, my impatience tends to get me in these positions from time to time. Another little lesson learned here was to, even though this is extremely small form factor, I thought I could delicately drill the screw into it, but uh, I did not pre-drill these holes, and as a result, I, I put a, a crack in the, in the actual piece. But then I came by, pre-drilled them, and I think it'll work just for the casting. Here's my casting clay. People have asked me about this. I'm not certain what makes a casting clay or casting sand any different. It is a sand of sorts, but I think it has a little bit of clay in the structure. Uh, it just seems to set up a little bit better and it doesn't sift off into the form once you pull those things off. And as I often do, I'm coating this particular form factor in tenactin spray, which makes it a little bit uh, harder for the clay to grab onto when it comes time to pull that form factor out. Something I need to teach myself to do when I'm pouring intricate form factors like this is to create, I don't know what you'd even call it, but an, an extra piece on the edge of the form factor and it's for the, for the molten metal to draw from. You pour it into a trough, I suppose, um, that sits off to the side of the form factor and then it pours, it pools up in the trough and then, and then sifts on through to the main form factor. As you'll see in a second here, I screwed that up when I came to actually pouring this. I come up with my own recipes for bronze or for brass. This is a bronze, I did put lead in this, but it's almost 80% copper, a little bit of brass, and, uh, and a little bit of tin solder, and then a pretty decent sized chunk of lead went into this. This is one of the kilns that I use for, or crucibles that I use for um, making things molten. This one takes a lot longer, but it holds a lot more. And here I'm pouring that, and as you notice, it just sort of uh, washes over the entire fixture, creating just this big clump 
uh, that I'll have to go back and triage later, as you see I'm doing here with the, with the Dremel. Um, actually, I'm, I'm poking holes in it so that I can get the Dremel in. I do not like Dremel work. It tends to just be feel so tedious to me. But in some instances, and certain certain blades on the Dremel do work. And this particular one, this particular blade, um, worked just fine to get those extra pieces off. Now it's time to just clean up the overall outside perimeter and, and, uh, and the profile on the outside on my belt sander. This thing I use all the time. It's terrific. It removes a lot of material and it's pretty safe. And then the good old die grinder for the inside. This is kind of like taking a, a sledgehammer to a, a fine project where you need more delicacy. But honestly, um, it, it seems to get the job done and I, I have to make small corrections. I thought I wouldn't use this drum sander again and here I am making a mistake already setting that up incorrectly. Um, as you can tell, the bottom plate needed to be much bigger. Uh, but I got it worked out, and honestly, this drum sander worked out really good for the application. I made that little 2x4 shoe, if you will, so that it's at a 30-degree angle, and I just set the, the buckle against that at a 30-degree angle, hit the drum sander across it, and it actually worked out really well. I felt kind of intelligent when I did this. Using this shoe on the drum sander, it creates a little bevel on the outside aspect of the buckle so that I don't need to use a file. I ended up using a file for the inside and I tried to use my die grinder here for the inside. Again, that was a bit overkill and it was also, I would say, probably a little on the unsafe side. Uh, so I ended up coming back with this. Um, this is a, a knife sharpening uh, piece of equipment that I have and it worked really, really good for that interior bevel. I did use a, a hand file on it as well. Uh, but what I'm doing is just trying to keep everything from looking so blocky and give it a little bit more of a softer edge to it. I think that came out pretty good. I keep this bin here of smaller pieces of metal that I use on all sorts of things. And this was a, uh, I think it's a hexagonal piece of, of metal that I'm going to use for the actual um, piece that, <laughs> I don't even know what you call it, the piece that goes from the buckle through the leather. I'm sure it has a name, but we're going to call it the uh, pointy McPointerson thing. I was going to put a twist into this, as I will end up doing that in this build here, but first I have to be very careful when I'm putting a piece of, of metal around brass, a piece of steel around brass, that I don't shatter the brass underneath it as I'm, as I'm uh, bending it. So I pre-bent it pretty well, got it hot, got it nice and annealed, and uh, I'm going to get ready to put it on the buckle. It felt like overkill to put that little thing into a forge, but it just made it so much easier to get it done in one fell swoop. And honestly, twisting this, it, twisting metal is very fun because it just makes things look more fancy and more interesting right off the bat with only a little bit of effort. You don't need a torch, or I'm sorry, you don't need a forge. You can do it with an acetylene torch, you can do it with a propane torch. Um, it's, it just adds uh, some, some uh, class or some intrigue to the things that you're doing. Now I'm gonna go ahead and apply this, uh, this pointy McPointerson to the actual buckle and lightly and delicately start to wrap it around. I also wanted to make sure that I made a patina for the brass. I just don't like the, the look of shiny brass. It's just as, even though this is bronze, it still has that brassy look. So with a little bit of uh, vinegar and a little bit of salt, I left this in overnight and came back the next day and thought, well, that looks all right. I put it in the oven and I baked it at 450 degrees for a couple of hours and it really set that patina up well. Now the great part about doing patinas or any sort of uh, surface coloring is you come back in to this piece of metal with a, <laughs> with a little child to help you um, and you start to scrape off just the surface and there's some occlusions in the metal and any sort of um, scrapes or edifices in the metal will, can, will carry that patina or that color underneath. And so it's to, it starts to look aged. It starts to look interesting to me. I'm gonna put a little bit of, of lube. This is actually mountain bike, um, some sort of lube for mountain bikes that you, I put underneath that. So my best friend supplied the leather. This is an inch and a half um, in, in width piece of leather and I'm going to start to cut out the, the hole where the pointy McPointerson is gonna go through as you see here. And then I'll rivet that together. I had a helper on this with me and these are, these are copper rivets um, that, that you can just buy off of Amazon and they're really easy to use. Great for leather too. 
and here my daughter, my little helper is going to help me along, uh, starting to hammer these rivets. And if I can be honest with you, she was just dreadful at this part. I mean, it just, she's like she didn't even know what she was doing. I had to do it for her. If you're ever going to do any sort of leather work, just invest in one of these hole punches. They're very inexpensive off Amazon and they're, they're just fantastic. Make, make quick work. I used to use a drill for this and the hole punch is so much more exact. As with metal, I also collect little pieces of leather, leather strapping. I use it all the time and that little piece of uh, strapping there I just had laying around so it actually worked out perfect for the belt. And now I just wanted to make some accent pieces. I don't really know exactly why and these aren't very necessarily symmetrical. There is no rhyme or reason to how many. I just wanted to put something on there to give it personality, give people the opportunity to look at it and say, I wonder what those were for as if there was a use for them in, in the past. Just gives it some personality. The belt is great. It's, I think, sized correctly for him. Uh, it's going to give him a little bit of room to to use on either side if he's using it over a garment. Um, it came out looking really good. It came out looking like something that uh, a warrior, a Viking warrior, would, would, would use. So I'm very pleased with the overall build. I think that he's going to uh, like it a lot, too, when he opens it for Christmas. Well, thank you for joining me this week on my build. That was really fun. It's great to make things for friends especially when you are thinking about them as you build it and what their reaction will be. Of course, my best friend, he doesn't know this, but I'm not going to charge him for it. It's going to be his Christmas present. Um, so a couple things that I learned. I learned that making a patina for brass and for copper is actually not quite as easy as it seems to be. You need to really, really, really clean off your brass or your bronze or your copper before you try to patina it. I didn't do that. My patina didn't set up. I also learned that to strengthen a patina or to speed it up, you can bake the item, which is what I did. And that worked out pretty well. Not quite what I wanted it to be, but it's there. And the other thing that I learned is this, when pouring a casting that is going to be small and rather delicate, I suppose, like that buckle, making a little trough for that molten metal to pour into, and then it will pour on through to the casting imprint is really going to be the way to go. Pouring it straight into this little teeny form factor did not work. I over poured it as you saw. Next week, I will be making a bench for my closet. My closet has long needed something for me to sit my big old butt down on so that I can put on my boots, my shoes, my clothes. I welcome you for the process. It's going to be a little bit avant-garde, a little different, and trying some things that I've never tried before. I'm looking forward to it. Until then, thank you for joining me and have a great weekend.